This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. We are the Paradoxical Eight. Bipedal, naked, large-brained, long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves, aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. I'd like to um, thank the organizers. It was a great opportunity to, to come and listen to all these talks and, and um, uh, present some as well. So um, I'd like to uh, start. Um, so genes are really um, central, and they're central for a couple reasons. I mean, first, uh, well, we, we can use lots of sources of evidence to identify which are the genes that are important in any process. Here we're talking. Uh, about skin pigmentation. So you have molecular biology data, clinically significant conditions, generally hypopigmentation, um, uh, different types of albinism, um, non-human animals, especially the mouse, has really been influential in helping us understand how genes affect pigmentation. Um, we can follow evolution in a number of ways, the molecular evolution as well as um, just the, the evolution across, across different populations. And uh, finally, admixture mapping. This is an approach to find the genes that determine um, differences between populations. And when we have those genes, we can then use them to design more experiments to help us understand better um, how they function. So knowing those genes is really central. Uh, we can address questions like where and when these um, uh, uh, new gene mutations happen that, that give us um, a, a different skin color in this, in this case, potentially improve diagnostic and treatments, um, test different kinds of molecular hypotheses, and finally, um, predict trait values. Uh, this could be useful in a forensic context. Um, when, when the person's not there, you don't have any information about who, it, who he is to make some prediction, as well as in epidemiology of skin is mediating something about um, the disease condition. Uh, we know it's really critical in producing enough vitamin D. Um, we, we can measure the skin from the DNA alone, so not having, uh, having measured it in the person. So there, there's a lot of potential um, there. Here's an example of a, 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 a melanocyte and keratinocytes. Typically, they reach up to 30 or 40 keratinocytes and pass off melanosomes. So just a little bit about the biology. We know a lot about the genes that are forming these melanosomes and, and controlling their transfer up to the keratinocytes. I've always been fascinated by uh, human variation. And here's a slide of um, uh, 18 uh, young women who we collected recently as part of our, our, our sampling. And uh, you can get quickly a sense of the diversity of human, human pigmentation, um, skin, hair, and eyes. Uh, from this. 
we can look at more detailed um, descriptions, quantitative descriptions. This is a, a histogram showing the um, pigmentation levels measured in three populations. The one on the far left is a European American sample from State College. The black bars to the right are African Americans from Washington, D.C., and then a sample of uh, African Caribbeans from, from England. And um, the African Caribbeans are shifted over to the right a little bit compared to the African Americans, um, and that's darker skin. And in fact, they have um, uh, less European ancestry, less European admixture than the uh, African Americans do, about 10% compared to 20%. So there's a strong relationship there between your um, recent admixture and, and your, your skin color. We do see, too, this red bar here shows you the extent of overlap. Because um, this slide also emphasizes how our observation of each other is, is uh, substantially biased. Uh, sociologists have studied this in detail, and light-skinned people see dark-skinned people as darker than they are. Dark-skinned people see light-skinned people as lighter than they are. So, you know, you, you can't really rely on your perceptions, or at least, I mean, it's worth looking inward to see, you know, what effect that may have on, on uh, how, you, how you see those around you. We know the um, environment has been a major factor in the evolution of, of skin color. Uh, that green line there is the equator, and uh, latitude, or the distance north and south of the equator, um, uh, have a major effect on, on skin color. Um, we know from more detailed analyses that it's actually the ultraviolet radiation at ground level that really has the strongest effect on skin color. So our skin is tied to the environment. And we can propose or discuss the different mechanisms that may be controlling this response. Um, I think the strongest evidence is for um, lightening of skin due to that need to produce vitamin D. There are very few natural sources that we can dietarily um, uh, consume enough vitamin D to, to keep us healthy, but our skin can produce vitamin D. So with ultraviolet light hitting your skin, you can produce vitamin D if your skin's light enough for that environment. And if you're exposed enough, if you have enough skin showing, if you spend enough time outdoors. Now, so lots of conditions on this, on, on being healthy um, through, through getting your, your vitamin D from your skin. Um, potentially immune suppression is also something that is, is um, good in certain instances. Um, darker skin probably evolved to protect us from sunburn, skin cancer, um, protect us from too much immune suppression, and also um, perhaps to uh, mediate folic acid uh, uh, photolysis, so pr to protect our folic acid stores from being destroyed. Ultraviolet light helps create vitamin D, but it also destroys folic acid. And finally, both um, low and, and high pigmentation can be uh, mediated through sexual selection and also the relaxation of selection as populations move from one area to another. So we can talk about the um, average history of our, our uh, of individuals, persons, and populations. Um, and this, this tree shows, um, I know it's kind of complex, but that's really the, the best representation that we can make of, of, of our history. And although this is about 10 years old, I think it still holds in, in most, of, most of the major branches here. And it's not only a branching through the fission, separation of populations, but also the fusion of populations. You can see here how we've drawn these little branches here to illustrate admixture or the movement of people to join other populations. Um, our, our species really has much more of a, um, a wisteria vine history where when branches cross, they fuse and they join again, making new populations as opposed to any kind of tree or bush pattern. That is an average pattern. Evolution really doesn't happen um, at least a lot of evolution, the adaptive evolution, happens more on a gene-by-gene -gene basis. So it's modular. Each gene has its own history. Um, the genes that cause differences among us today are genes that have very recent evolutionary histories and have been very actively evolving in, in the past, um, you know, 75,000 years, say, since human populations had their common origin 
in Africa. Many populations stayed in Africa. Some small set of populations moved out of Africa. And we have tools that we let us study how these, um, you know, um, uh, tracking the molecular evolution of these genes and how quickly they evolved, uh, showing clear evidence that they have evolved recently or changed frequency recently. Um, so these are very valuable tools. I'll show you uh, an application of, of one of those methods in a minute. But I want to focus really on just three populations to start with. These aren't the three most important populations or three central populations. That tree I showed you before is really a better, better sampling of, of uh, human diversity, but these are worth looking at. You know, we were initially very light-skinned before we lost our fur. All mammals are. You, you spread your cat's fur, even as a black cat, you'll see the, the skin is white underneath. As we lost our fur, uh, changed our habits, we, we, we needed to become dark-skinned. There's other branches here. The second branch is a common branch to East Asians and Europeans. Um, the third branch there is, um, would contain skin lightening events that were specific to East Asians. The fourth branch is the branch with specific to European um, changes. And finally, additional skin darkening events possibly on that fifth branch that I show in this, in this tree. So I mentioned admixture mapping before, and this is really a fundamental tool for finding the genes that cause differences between populations. Most of the genes are the same across all populations. If you look at the frequencies of, of, of alleles across populations, about 95% of the total variation is in common. You know, we have this very recent common history, but for certain things, especially superficial aspects, superficial traits, uh, we have evolved very, very quickly. And um, we can map those kinds of genes with with this approach. So you basically start out with two parents, one light skin, one dark skin. These are the histograms describing their distributions. When they, when they um, mate, you have the uh, first admix generation, and there's much less variation in skin color here, or whatever trait it is that you're talking about. Uh, everybody has two copies, one, uh, two genomes, one from a European ancestor, one from an African ancestor in this case, but, but by that second generation and all the generations afterwards, you have a lot of variation, a lot of phenotypic variation, and these are ideal samples for discovering which are the genes that are affecting this, this trait. Here it is as a chromosomal view. So you have two European chromosomes, two African chromosomes, or one of each. You get one of each by having one parent from each population. These black bars are recombination points. So um, you don't pass on to your kids the same chromosomes you got from your parents. You mix them up and then pass on this mixed up um, set of chromosomes to your, to your kids. And after a few generations, you end up with these uh, chimeric chromosomes that have different ancestry segments. So we can track those ancestry segments and use that information to map, to map genes. We do need to be careful about um, stratification, so there's variation in admixture levels across populations. So this, this slide here shows you how the proportion of West African ancestry is positively correlated with a skin color measure, the M index. Um, you see a positive correlation. You also see the variance is different. So there's a lot more dispersion here, a lot more variability, and um, this is because like most traits, skin color is much more variable in Africa. Even just considering the subset of Africa, West Africa, where the enslaved ancestors of the African Americans and Brazilians and uh, other populations that are represented here were derived. So even that, that subset of Africa is much more variable than Europe. But you have this confounding. So you have to deal with the fact that ancestry is gonna be correlated with any, or skin color will be correlated with any marker that you measure that's different between those parental groups. But you can reduce that. You can remove that statistically. It's a process called conditioning or controlling. You basically remove the effects of one variable to study another. This is the, uh, the Duffy null locus, locus that varies substantially between populations. And you can see the genotype determines the distribution of skin color. It has nothing to do with skin color. When you control for the uh, variation in ancestry, you get rid of that, uh, that effect on skin color. This is uh, 
uh, the cover of, a, of, a, of a, uh, the journal where we published on the SLC 24A5 gene. Um, this gene was first discovered by um, uh, Keith Chang as the golden gene for zebrafish. So it affected zebrafish coloration. Keith called me up and said, hey, does this, you know, maybe this affects skin color. I was quite skeptical until I looked at the public data set where it showed, uh, a, a, you know, a locus where Europeans, the, the blue dot here, were totally fixed for an allele. You, you didn't find much in other populations. That's a very unusual circumstance. And um, sure enough, it has a very dramatic effect on skin color. You can see that here. Even after controlling for ancestry, you still have a strong effect on skin color. And in fact, in genome-wide admixture mapping, we find SLC24A5 is really the strongest gene affecting skin color. Um, you see these other smaller peaks here. Once you condition for the effect of SLC24A5, those genes are much more prominent. So you can see that you can, you can detect those. So this, this statistical conditioning is a very common tool and uh, very, very useful. Um, one of the interesting things we found about not only SLC24A5, but some of those other genes that come up in this, this gene mapping analysis, like, like SLC45A2 or the MATP gene, is that the variation that causes Europeans to be light-skinned is not the same as the variation that cause East, causes East Asians to be light-skinned. So this selective pressure to uh, lighten the skin uh, probably in, in, in response to migrating to higher latitudes where there's less ultraviolet light was, was quite strong. I mean, it's affecting, seems to affect any population that moves to a higher latitude. Um, and th this was really kind of unexpected. Um, you know, we, we, we had other hypotheses about populations like Melanesians. Maybe they shared or didn't share genes with darker skinned populations. Um, but, you know, this is... This is what we found. And in fact, there are many genes. I'm not going to talk to you about um, uh, many of these other genes, but I just want to show you um, a slide that, that, that um, identified you know, what, what we're finding about where these genes occur and, and on which branches they seem to have evolved. So we're, we're not finding too many that are on this common branch of lightning um, in the common population af coming out of Africa. Um, and only a few that are back as far as, you know, um, uh, on the common branch of all, all human populations. But some of these are more difficult to study, too. This is probably the case. I don't think that those genes don't uh, uh, exist and we can't understand them. We just haven't been able to find them yet. One very interesting tool we have is to look at the, the local genetic diversity. So this is using um, short tandem repeats or STRs. Um, if you watch too many uh, crime TV shows, you probably already know this acronym. <laughs> but it's, uh, the, these are the markers you use for identity analysis. If you have a forensic case, you, you type the STR alleles. And you can see there's lots of different variants. This is the chromosome here that doesn't have the new allele, the A allele, that gives you a lighter skin. This is the chromosome with the lighter skin. So you can see there's much less variation on that chromosome, even though it's basically fixed in Europeans. So there's lots of copies of that chromosome, which usually means it's old and you're gonna see lots of different mutations on it, lots of different STR alleles, but you don't. You only see pretty much you know, one primary allele on most of these. So you can use that information to, to date when that mutation occurred. Or, or when it started to change frequency. That's really the more important point, is you know, when did that really start to evolve? So the dates or the time is here, and the, the um, selective coefficient, how strong the selection was, is, is there. And you can put these on a tree then. So you can look at when the timing of um, some of these genes, it's SLC24A5, MATP, and TRP1, changed frequency compared to when um, kit ligand and some of the other ones change frequency, and they seem to match those splits on the tree. So I just want to say we're very grateful to uh, all of our volunteers who participated in these research projects, and I have lots of other colleagues who have um, also um, helped in, in, in getting to this, this point. And there are several other research labs as well who are looking into a lot of these same questions. Um, so thank you very much.
We share with these beautiful cousins of ours skin that serves a variety of important functions, and we've heard a lot about those functions already today, protection, thermoregulation. Today I'm going to reprise a little bit of what's been said already about those first two functions and then talk somewhat about this enormous realm of human communication that we engage in with skin. Over time and through evolution, if we compare the relative importance of, prote of protection and thermoregulation versus communication, we can see that in human evolution, communication has become one of the major functions of skin, especially since the evolution of functionally naked skin. I want to first just reprise a little bit of information about protection, though, because it's useful to think about what we lost. Hair is enormously useful, and our primate relatives and our mammalian ancestors had hair that helped to insulate and protect against all manner of environmental problems and abrasion ultraviolet radiation and water, and hair helps to slow the ingress of pathogens to the skin. But we lost hair. And although there is some controversy about why we lost it and exactly when, uh, we know that we now have functionally naked skin probably by early homo times, and almost certainly for reasons having to do with the need to keep cool during exercise by a high volume of ecrine sweating. And what the important uh, conclusion of this is, is that for much of our, the key portions of our evolution, hairless bodies are our interface with the environment, a very different situation than in other mammals. The evolution of the, of the stratum corneum, the very top part of the epidermis, is something that has been dealt with a lot in, in the dermatological literature. We know that the epidermis, and particularly the stratum corneum at the very surface of the epidermis here, resists abrasion, restricts water loss, and prevents the ingress of pathogens, but that great change from the haired to the hairless condition basically involved changes to the stratum corneum. So when we think about really what Ajit Varki's point was at the very beginning of the symposium, why is the skin different? Uh, we see from referring to the chimp genome project that in fact the skin is the most distinct organ. Human skin has been, uh, has many genes that have been evolving independently and very different from those of chimpanzees, much more so than any organ or cell system. And the most important genes in this regard are those having to do with the stratum corneum and the barrier functions of the epidermis. We could go on at length my colleague, Peter Elias, has done distinguished work in this area. We know that this stratum corneum in humans is particularly lipid rich, that we have interferon gamma that helps to generate a potent antiviral state in the stratum corneum, and that the skin microbiome plays an enormously important and still uh, quite uh, unclear but emerging role. The skin also has to protect against another major assault, which is that of the sun and particularly ultraviolet radiation. We know from data provided from NASA that the ultraviolet radiation load that we get on the Earth's surface is strongest around the equator, shown in the, in the bright pink and red tones here in the map, much, much lower as we get close to the poles, especially in these large land masses in the northern hemisphere. How have humans coped with these high levels of UV in our ancestral areas and much lower levels in areas out or areas of habitation later in aspects of our evolution. In early Homo, 
the loss of body hair is associated with the development of permanent dark pigmentation. So instead of having dark hair covering lightly pigmented skin, we evolve permanently darkly pigmented skin. And that is largely to do with the production of high amounts of the tremendously interesting pigment called eumelanin, a fascinating polymer that has myriad important properties, the most important for our purposes being the ability to scatter and absorb ultraviolet radiation and prevent damage to underlying tissues. Ultraviolet radiation causes a lot of damage to the skin that can lead to skin cancer, especially in individuals who are genetically susceptible. But skin cancer rarely causes mortality. So I, as someone who was interested in, in figuring out why skin pigmentation evolved as it did, and specifically why dark pigmentation evolved, got very interested in, in the effect of ultraviolet radiation on something that would really count for reproductive success in evolution. And I started looking a lot at folate metabolism. Without going into a lot of detail, suffice it to say that we need folate, one of the key B vitamins, in order to fuel DNA synthesis, which is particularly important in certain parts of, of our development and life, especially in early embryogenesis, when we know that folate is critical for the formation of the embryonic neural tube, which is the precursor of the modern or the, the uh, adult nervous system. So if you have an environmental agent like ultraviolet radiation that can actually break down folate and affect other aspects of the fo of folate metabolism in a pregnant mother, then you can affect reproductive success. And this is why we've highlighted that mechanism. So here I say the primary, not the only, but the primary selective force for the evolution of permanent dark pigmentation is protection against ultraviolet-induced changes in folate availability and DNA synthesis in early embryogenesis and in sperm production. But humans did not remain in the ancestral environment of Africa. Much of human evolution, including much of Homo sapiens evolution, has occurred in Africa. Tremendous amounts of diversification, but humans have moved around a lot. And here we can see in the history of, of modern humans, we have people moving small populations moving out of Africa into areas of very different ultraviolet radiation, including very low areas, or very low UV areas, later in our evolutionary history. Why is that important? Because ultraviolet radiation, mostly a malign influence that we think about in evolution, is a creative influence and is extremely important in all vertebrates in the production of vitamin D in the skin. Without ultraviolet B radiation, we cannot make vitamin D in the skin. And what we have shown in, in our research, and this has been supported by many collateral lines of evidence, is that the primary selective force for the evolution of lightly pigmented, or more correctly, depigmented skin, is promotion of ultraviolet radiation-induced vitamin D production in the skin under conditions of low and seasonal ultraviolet radiation. And so here in modern humans, we have this beautiful and delightful contrast between skin on the left that maximizes photoprotection against ultraviolet radiation and skin on the right that maximizes photosynthesis of vitamin D under conditions of low UV. And skin pigmentation is a superb evolutionary compromise, something that we should talk about in our classes of evolution and human biology, a superb compromise that is an excellent illustration of the action of natural selection on the human body. 
thermoregulation, I'm only going to say that as we evolved uh, through time, we became far more active. This beautiful example of an early member of the genus Homo was not a tentative biped. This was a striding, running, active individual that built up a lot of body heat under hot environmental conditions. Here was the, the natural selective substrate, as it were, for the loss of most functional body hair. Evaporation of sweat is impeded by hair, and so we reason that most body, most functional body hair was actually lost because of the importance of facilitating sweat, the evaporation of sweat from the surface of the body. And so functional hairlessness then can best be thought about as facilitating active body, body cooling, whole body cooling through eccrine sweating during lengthy periods of sustained exercise. Communication has always been an important function of skin. Whether we're talking about a distant mammalian ancestor or a primate relative, primates touch one another, communication through touch, especially beginning with infant mother communication is central. This continues and is elaborated in the hairless uh, human infant and in hairless bodies contacting one another. And we know that this type of touch communication is absolutely essential for mother-infant bonding in our primate relatives and in ourselves. When we lost most of our body hair, we lost an important method of displaying our emotions. This chimpanzee on the left is exhibiting a display, a very visible display of anger and aggression toward the individual on the right. And he is able to manifest this magnificent raising of hackles. What do we do without, without hair? We have no hackles. We might, our little feeble hairs might go up. <laughs> what do we do instead? We don't know for certain, but what we do know <laughs> is that modern humans have much more finely differentiated and highly active facial muscles than do even chimpanzees. And we have the evolution of enhanced facial expressivity in humans that is probably related to that loss of expressivity in the raising of the hackles. As soon as humans evolved naked skin, or probably very soon thereafter, people realized that they could decorate their skin. We don't know when they happened upon this, but we have some enticing evidence that comes from Blombos Cave in South Africa from about 70,000 years ago that would indicate that by that time, people were beginning to use ochre for decorations and for decorating the inside of rock shelters. This is exciting because I would venture that probably long before this, humans had been using ochre and similar pigments to rub on themselves, to mark themselves. We can't prove this, but it seems highly likely. Humans are lavish decorators of themselves. We may not have colorful fur, but we more than compensate for this by having myriad ways of decorating ourselves with body paint, with cosmetics. In most cultures, both sexes are involved and many parts of the body are involved in decoration. There is no culture that we know in the world that does not adorn its skin in some way. Modern humans have developed not only body paints, but also cosmetics, now mostly associated with women, but certainly centuries ago not. A lavish form of communication that is incredibly important that individuals can manipulate and change from one day or one season to another. We also start making 
permanent marks on our body. We know from the preserved remains of the so-called Tyrolean Iceman, dating from around 5,000 years ago, that we have evidence of tattooing of the skin. These are thought to be therapeutic tattoos that were on the skin, not necessarily decorative. Many of them are crosses or simple lines, parallel lines. But the fact that they're, that they're present that early in the archeological record with, uh, in Neolithic humans is significant. And humans around the world tattoo themselves, and sometimes lavishly. This uh, woman from Burma has beautiful facial tattoos that signify her marriage, her marriageable status, and that identify her to a particular uh, clan group. But what do we say just through our color? And the rest of this lecture I want to devote to the messages, the communication that actually comes from our color. During most of human history, humans moved around slowly. They came into contact with one another gradually. There were no big surprises. And it's not surprising that through much of history, not just prehistory, but much of history, we have no indication that humans treated one another differently on the basis of color. It only is relatively recent, in the last few hundred years, that color becomes something that has social significance and that has some kind of set of stereotypes and even stigmas attached to it. And we really see the emergence of a modern color consciousness beginning in the 18th century, when innate skin color comes to communicate both racial identity or race uh, belonging and social status. One of the most interesting figures in this history is the philosopher Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant was a very careful reader of Linnaeus, the great taxonomist. Linnaeus made very simple descriptions of humans according to skin color and geography. Later, he associated skin color and geography with some characteristics of behavior and culture. Kant was an avid reader of Linnaeus. And Kant, although he's known far more for his uh, his thoughts on rationality and human thinking had tremendous curiosity about human diversity, human origins, and the origins of human capacity for civilization. And so he thought a lot about Linnaeus and what Linnaeus said, and Kant, not a naturalist, but Immanuel Kant, the philosopher, was the first to actually enunciate the presence of four races. And the key thing about Kant's races were that in his mind they were immutable. They couldn't change ever. And this was not just a list, it was a hierarchy. And critical here is the primacy of the white race, which is something that we see emerging again in different guises for many centuries or many decades after this. Kant's tremendous influence was complemented by the importance of maintaining a strict social hierarchy in order to keep the transatlantic slave trade going. By the early 1800s, there was tremendous pressure to end slavery, to end the slave trade, but it was very, very financially appealing and important for the hierarchy of races, and especially the primacy of the white race over the so-called black race, to be enunciated so that slavery could be maintained. 
And we see this complementarity between a philosophical and a religious or pseudo-religious underpinning for race hierarchies and slavery along with the, the mercantile and capitalist underpinnings. A very pernicious system that led to the social differentiation of color, something that hadn't existed at least in as strong a form and violent a form before. And so we see race definitions that are associated with color that lead seemingly inexorably to the development of racial stereotypes, especially when they're propagated by individuals like Kant, like Thomas Jefferson, who were highly socially influential through their writings, leading to the development of what I've called color memes that are adopted and transmitted from family to family, generation to generation, leading to a durable psychosocial template for racism. So skin, coming from this, this delightful and beautiful evolutionary background, skin color actually reflects our evolutionary history, but in this most recent part of human written history, comes to represent something entirely different. But I am not a pessimistic person. And the beautiful thing about humans as primates is that we are tremendously imitative and suggestible, and we can change. We adopted in Western civilization broadly certain attitudes toward color, and we can change those attitudes. We're not, create, we're not trapped by the color memes that we have created. And this aspect of communication through skin can in fact change. I want to celebrate the beauty of human skin and invite you to think more about the, the exquisite path that skin has taken through the last seven or so million years of the human lineage. The evolution of hairlessness, functional nakedness, sweating, the development of, of these marvelous appendages, and the beautiful feast of microbes and other creatures that live on the surface of our skin. And then the superb things that we do with this beautiful naked canvas that has been produced by evolution. Let's celebrate those and continue an active program of research. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank very much to the uh, organizers of this conference for inviting me. I just want to, as I frequently speak to clinical audiences, I have to make my de declaration of disclaimer. <laughs> I, essentially, uh, I essentially work in borrowed space, use borrowed money, and I'm living on borrowed time. <laughs> Hence, I like as my theme Thomas Huxley's remark that scientists over 60 do more harm than good. <laughs> now, I want to direct you to a traveling story. Skin is our major defense against uh, an onslaught of one of the strongest carcinogens that we experience, ultraviolet light. And some years ago, I was directed to this village in northern Guatemala where the missionaries told us that the children had enormous amounts of skin cancer and they were dying at the 10 years of age. Now, commonly you might think skin cancer as an older person's problem. These are dramatic examples of how if we lose the genetic defense against sun exposure, cancer it can be an enormously disastrous problem at the skin level. So they directed me to this village and it had the phenotype of a disease that I had worked on for many years, xeroderma pigmentosum. It's normally a recessive disease. In the US population, it occurs about one to four to per million of the population. 25% of the children had this disease. They lived under extreme uh, poverty, 
when we had a look at the patients, you could see the enormous sun damage over their face and the painful sunburns. When we brought cells back, you can see here and expose these cells to ultraviolet light in the lab, whereas a normal skin has excellent survival, their cells were killed at very, very low doses of UV. So they had a genetic predisposition in which they could not handle sun exposure or solar exposure. We sequenced and we found that they lacked what we call now the global genome repair pathway. The founder effect in this village was a mutation which cost, which removed one cytosine from a gene we call XPC, which is one of the main damage recognition proteins in the skin. When we did a even though uh, staining of a section of the skin, the black staining here are indications of high expression of the XPC protein in the epidermis of normal skin. From the Guatemalan village, there is no expression of this gene. As a result, the cells fail to recognize DNA damage, and it goes on to develop into cancer. And I'll show you some of the uh, ramifications of this. Now, xeroderma pigmentosum, X XP, is one of a family of sun-sensitive diseases involving different components of the nucleotide excision repair pathway. As an aside, I'd just like to mention that you may have seen that the um, Nobel Prize for Chemistry this year was given to Tom Lindahl, uh, Aziz Senkar, and, uh, um, and the mismatch repair pathway. Uh, for unraveling the biochemistry of this pathway. Now, xeroderma pigmentosum is unique among the repair systems for solar UV in that they have very high cancer. These other diseases are also components of the same repair pathway, but they essentially are photosensitive but without skin cancer, and especially a disease here known as the UVS syndrome has acute sunburn, but no neurological different disorders, none of the developmental or disorders that occur in cocaine syndrome, and a very mild version. So there's an extremely wide variation in the genetic response to sun exposure. Now the main photoproducts caused by UV occur between the two adjacent pyrimidines in the DNA. The major photoproduct is the dimer, in which two so covalent bonds are formed. An alternative photoproduct, the 6-4 photoproduct. Now, if you do not remove these photoproducts, this, the, either of these, if you don't remove them biochemically from the DNA, they can go on to interfere with DNA replication. And a cytosine in a TC photoproduct can deaminate, codes as an A, you know, codes as a T, and then opposite an A is placed, after two cycles of replication, a TC sequence becomes a TT. So a C to a T transition mutation in a TC sequence is an absolute fingerprint for UV exposure and a UV-induced mutation. Now, the excision repair pathway for UV damage has two major routes. If the, gene, if the DNA is unexpressed, which is a large majority of, the, of our DNA, damage is recognized by a dedicated damage recognition protein of which XPC, the Guatemalan population, has a mutation. So they fail to recognize. An alternative mechanism by which damage is recognized is an arrested transcription. If cells can cannot recover from this, they have the disease called cocaine syndrome. And then these two pathways converge on an extensive remodeling system to repair the DNA. If we look more closely at the transcription process, there are two strands, the coding strand and the template strand. The template strand is the one on which is transcribed into RNA. The repair of these two strands is different. The XBC system repairs this strand. The transcribed strand is repaired by a complex of proteins that are associated with a transcription complex. The difference between these two strands have a major impact on carcinogenesis. If first, if you look at repair in terms of the removal of number of photoproducts, with time, 
in a rapidly ex in a highly expressed gene like p53 or DHFR, the photoproducts were removed rapidly. In unexpressed or lower expressed genes, the photoproducts were removed to a much lower extent. So the rate of repair depends upon which strand the damage lies. We then collaborated recently with a group in Seattle, Larry Loeb and Kate Bayless, in which they used a high throughput sequencing method to determine exactly what are the sequence changes in a UV irradiated population. Now, those of, you, those of us who've worked in mammalian cell biology and tissue culture and mutagenesis realize that over the years, we've only had one or two genes that were capable of studying mutagenesis in culture because of the, number, the, the rarity of having a drug-selectable locus. With high throughput sequencing, we can get by that completely. And so here is the result of measuring the mutation frequency in nucleotide changes per 10 to the seventh nucleotides, high resolution sequencing, averaged over a large number of genes that are relevant for skin cancer. And you can see that in a wild type normal cell, there's a low in increase in mutation as a function of dose, but in a XPC, such as we see in Guatemala village, an enormous increase in mutation rates, going up from 0.5 up to 5, a tenfold or more increase in mutation rates. We then decided, once we had that system working, we went back to, to Guatemala. And with some help of a clinical service team that goes there from San Diego regularly to treat the patients and give them some clinical help, we brought back five squamous carcinomas from this population, sequenced three million single nucleotide mutations by exome sequencing. Transition mutations were the majority in XPC. Now, since it was a small population size, we didn't concentrate on which genes were mutated, but we asked, what is the frequency of mutations per kilobase across the whole genome? And asked, what's the mutation density? When we do that, this is a very interesting situation to illustrate how the genome structure and function had a major impact on mutation rates. In a normal population, seen here, normal squamous carcinomas from a normal population, there is a protein in the histone that methylates a region and suppresses access for other enzymes. As a result, the mutation density is, goes up because those regions of the, of the chromatin are inaccessible to repair. As transcription increases across the genome, we find that this is, removes the repression, and as a result, mutation frequency declines. But still, if you compare the non-transcribed strand to the transcribed strand in the tumor, there are more mutations in the non-transcribed strand. When we move to the XPC tumors from the Guatemalan patients, we find no removal of mutagenic lesions right across the genome, irrespective of transcription level. But in the transcribed strand, very efficient removal. Now, this is a striking illustration of the fact that it, de it depends critically which strand of the DNA is damaged and which one gets repaired. If, you fail to, if the cells fail to repair the non-transcribed strand, mutation rate is very high when replication comes along there. On the other strand, the transcribed strand, it doesn't matter how well that's repaired in the Guatemalan population, because they can't repair the other strand, cancer is high. So that the repair of this transcribed strand can be very efficient, but it confers absolutely no protection against UV-induced mutations in carcinogenesis. Now, if we can turn to another response of the skin to ultraviolet exposure, sunburn, we often think, and it's established more or less, that the, uh, the risk for melanoma from the sun is related to how many sunburns you get. Well, in squamous carcinoma, there's a very different situation. This is the spectrum of xeroderma pigmentosum patients from sun exposure. You can have a patient with very high erythema and sunburn. You can have patients with freckling, patients that develop severe skin cancer. So you're going to have this range, and this is under genetic control. If you look, and this is data published recently from England, where they, have, they bring in all the XP patients from the country and treat them and follow them in one single location. And this was reported a couple of years ago. If you look at 
Sunburn versus which gene in the XB repair pathway is mutated. If you look at patients with mutations in XBC, XBE, or XBV, which are genes that code for proteins involved in the processing of DNA damage in the non-expressed regions of the genome. They get cancer, but they get no sunburn. However, if the genes are involved in repair and in transcription, sunburn is very high. If you now look at the probability of cancer and then look at patients that are involved, that in which the genes involved in transcription, the cancer appears slowly over time. And the 50% onset is out in the, almost out as, as, far, as late as the normal population. If we look at XPC and E patients, which are involved in the repair of the non-transcribed regions and they don't get sunburn, the cancers are appearing more rapidly with a 50% onset at about the age of 20. So that a, an acute sunburn in this disease is actually delays squamous carcinoma. It's the converse of what you get with melanoma. As an aside, it's interesting to me to note that the 50% onset here is in the early 20s. In American xeroderma patients, it occurs below the age of 10, which is reminiscent from my childhood that England is a pretty cloudy, damp, rainy place. <laughs> um, so let me just summarize. Xeroderma pig pigmentosum and related nucleotide repair diseases highlight mechanisms of sunburn and cancer. Repair is more rapid in more, in more highly expressed genes, presumably because an expressed gene has to open up the chromatin to allow transcription to work, whereupon repair can work. Now, de deficient repair of solar UV products in the non-transcribed strand and in unexpressed DNA is, results in a high mutation rate and cancer. But deficient repair in the transcribed strand results in increased sunburn. Cancer is delayed or not increased. And in fact, in cocaine syndrome, which is uniquely involved in repair of the transcribed strand, those patients with cocaine syndrome have severe developmental disorders, but as far as we know, they never get cancer. So my question that I leave you with is, can we increase repair in otherwise healthy persons to protect against skin cancer, including melanoma and other cancers? And alternatively, since the nucleotide excision repair pathway repairs UV type damage, which is large modifications of DNA, very similar to what occurs when you use chemotherapy like cisplatins, since it's the same repair pathway, can we inhibit repair and then sensitize cancers to chemotherapy with very few side effects? So I leave you with that. Thank you. <laughs>